Thanks everybody for coming, we have a big audience. So today we have Jack Moravis speaking, it's a huge honor. He's gonna speak on the group completion of the Bureau representation. Honestly, this is a exciting and a great honor and a heavy responsibility to, to be talking here and it's sort of wonderful and I wanna thank you all uh, for the opportunity. Here's the first thing I should do. Here's my distinguished co-author and actually the senior member of this team and my sort of nearby reality brother-in-law and uh, wingman and friend for many years. So this is, it's hard, this, it's hard to say when this collaboration started, it's been going on forever. And I'm just gonna try to talk about this stuff uh, rather than read things in detail. Actually, I thought it might be useful to sort of go through the table of contents and tell roughly what's going to happen in what sections as best I can predict. When I was looking at these notes, I realized that I'm actually assuming a lot about what people are going to know. For example, I'm going to assume that people know about, you know, grades written in the art and alphabet, things like a lot of things about grade groups, but also some things about diffeomorphism groups uh, of punctured spheres and that, the, that these things are related that uh, the braid group on N strings can be identified with the group of components of the group of diffeomorphisms of a sphere with punctures. And that when I say sphere with punctures, I mean literally spheres with punctures, not spheres with bounded component, with boundary components, because I want to be able to talk about things that go singular at the boundary rather than behaving well at the boundary. A lot about configuration spaces. Uh, that when I talk about the space of finite subsets of the complex numbers, I mean finite subsets of the complex numbers and not labeled points. So finite subsets of the complex numbers are sort of an unordered set. And when I talk about diffeomorphisms of those kind of things, uh, I'm going to be talking about diffeomorphisms that take that set into that set, but might permute the points around in that set. And so that's all stuff that has can be illustrated with pictures, but uh, it's sort of limited the pictures one can draw into these circumstances. So I'm just going to call on that um, when I need to. And sort of early on, I want to state the group completion theorem because I think it's an important theorem in mathematics and that people should know about it. But I'm not actually going to use it for much beyond some very special cases. But Part of the story here is that it actually is the non-commutative version of the growth and deconstruction. And that there's a lot of literature about it, but that's mostly about the abelian case when it has to do with group completing monoids. And a lot of the monoids that come up in topology and geometry are abelian, but the group completion theorem is much more general. So I figure it at least deserves to be stated. So I'll do that at a certain point and then sort of uh, put it in the closet and not use it any further. Okay, so that's the sort of stuff in the first section. There's gonna be, I'm afraid, a lot of sort of topic hopping in this talk. So one thing that, well, I find confusing is, well, so I'm gonna be talking about the, the braid monoid. I wanna think of the collection of braid groups uh, as a category in which there's one object for each number of strands and has the braid group on that set of strands as the endomorphism of that strand and no morphisms between strands of different uh, cardinality. Okay, so that's a groupoid. It's a category with objects co uh, corresponding to the empty set plus the natural numbers. Um, and um, as a groupoid, it's a category. So if you think of it as a category, then the category has a geometric, has a nerve and then a geometric um, uh, realization, which is then a mono, which is then a topological space, which has a monoidal structure, which it inherited from its underlying groupoid. The monoidal structure there consisted of taking a finite set of points and a finite set of points and putting them together and then letting them trace out a grade somehow. Hope I'm getting this. So you start with a braid groupoid, think of it as a category, geometrically realize it. That's a topological monoid with now a new composition. And you can group complete that. 
So you can, I indicate group completion by putting bars around things. And so you can put bars and then you take a disjoint union and put more bars, but that means you have to put them one by one. Anyway, uh, the group completion says in this case that when you take the, the braid group and group complete it as a monoid in this sense, then you get this homotopy theoretic, this homotopy type, which is, uh, I guess, weakly equivalent to the space of maps, pointed maps from the two sphere to itself. That space has a lot of components. It has one for each degree of maps for this, between the two spheres. And so does the completion, so does the braid thing, uh, the, the thing that I've illustrated with the plus that also has fundamental group equal to the integers. Now you've introduced sort of negative braids there. So here I claim here that this uh, braid group uh, gives you maps from the two sphere to the two sphere. There's a geometric reason for this uh, and it generalizes to the N sphere. So actually there's this beautiful model for maps from the N sphere to the N sphere for the space of maps from the N sphere to the N sphere which goes back to Newton for God's sake. It, and it involves configuration spaces. So it says, the construction says, take your Euclidean space, sprinkle around a bunch of charged particles, all the same charge, all the same sign, and look at the electrical potential field that they generate. So in dimension D, in dimension three, you get the inverse square law, but that's the gradient of the potential function, which is like one over one over x. Okay, that works for all dimensions. That's a harmonic function on Euclidean space, with the exception in dimension two, where the uh, where the appropriate solution of the harmonic equation is the logarithm, the complex logarithm. So the way that map works sounds preposterous, I guess, but the idea is. Uh, you take your um, take some points in the plane. Here I've got them arbitrarily labeled zero, one, and infinity. Distinct points. Uh, so you're in the plane. So you put a point at infinity, and then you collapse the whole set, the finite that finite set plus the point at infinity to a point. Here's one way to think of it. I didn't think to draw it as it ought to be. Uh, which is more like, like this picture up here, uh, where the points are sort of equidistributed or they're sitting in a compact region. And then there's another point outside that at, the, at infinity. So you look at a finite subset of the plane in that sense, and you pinch them all to uh, a point and you get something that looks like this or over there. Um, that's a surface that has, that's a singular surface and is pi one is a big free group. I guess all I, want to, all I want to say at this point is that this map, which goes from the configuration space to the space of maps of the sphere to itself is actually, it becomes a homotopy equivalence after group completion. So I'll come back to that, I guess. This slide says that talks about the map from the braid monoid to the symmetric group to the monoid of permutations, to the category of finite sets and bijections between them, about the map that sends the braid to its endpoint permutation. Those preserve the monoidal structure of putting things next to each other. Um, and if you group complete that construction, you get a map from double loops on the two sphere to the group of stable maps of the stable sphere preserving degree. So that's a map of homotopy theoretic objects and you can ask what that does. And uh, what it does on in dimension zero is send a braid on n strands to the number of permutations possible, which is n in the integers. And in degree one, it sends the degree one map, the, this uh, pi one of this is turns out to be loops two as three, um, I'm sorry. Uh, turns out to be identified with loops two S three by the Hopf vibration. And you get the integers in degree two and the map down sends that copy of the integers to the integers mod two. So it sends that pi one 
element, which is going to be a major topic today called the writhe, and sends it to its parity, which is the sign of the determinant, the sign of the permutation uh, it defines on its influence. So this is just to say that those two things look similar in dimension, in dimension zero and one, but in higher degree, things are different. Anyway, what I just said about the map in degree one has to do with uh, this thing called the writhe of a braid, which you can calculate in terms of an Artin presentation by writing down the Artin generators and uh, just taking their associated ex exponent sum, the number of sort of overcrossings minus less the number of undercrossings. Uh, that depends on a, on a, plan, uh, a planar projection. And so uh, there's a more invariant way of talking about this. If you think of braids as framed um, uh, oriented tangles embedded in the backboard plane with the orientations that that gives you, they should be invertible tangles. Braids are just sort of invertible objects in the class of tangles. You can define this invariant, the derive, which is basically, which arises from the abelianization of the braid group. If you just take the braid group and write down the relations, if you take the write down the braid relations and make them commutative, they say that they all represent all the art and generators represent the same element in the um, abelianization. And so the abelianization is just the integers. It's just free on one generator. In inside the monoid of uh, the groupoid of braids, there's a subgroupoid of braids for which this writhe invariant is zero. So the kernel of this abelianization is the derived group of the braid group, B, commutator B. Um, and uh, things in this subcategory, this sub monoid, uh, I'm going to call derived braids because uh, I can't resist a cheap pun. Uh, and it's an interesting sub monoid. Uh, it was basically described first in the late 60s by Goreen and Lean, who were two kind of people in Art Arnold's circle in Mos uh, Moscow, but not actually in his group. Uh, this was just when Arnold was starting to do singularity theory. Uh, anyway, it's, uh, it turns out that the first couple of these things, of these derived, derived degrade groups are zero, like the writhe, the only two braid of y of zero is the trivial braid. And uh, up here at the top, I tried to draw a picture of a braid of a braid of y, a four strand braid of y of zero. But aside from uh, the third and fourth group, all the higher uh, derived groups are perfect. Okay, I'm going to come back to that slide in a minute. Here's the statement of the group completion theorem. The point of this is that if you take a topological monoid, then it has a space of components, which is also a monoid. Um, and if you group complete the topological monoid, that topological monoid, you get a map of homology algebras. These things are monoids, so they're homologies they're, as a Pontryagin product. You get a map of such things. And that map is the localization of the original thing that you get by making the maps in degree zero, the components, it make them invertible. So like if you have um, a natural uh, uh, zero through infinity integers, braids, finite sets, and you group complete, you group complete that monoid to the integers z, and you get exactly the thing uh, the exactly the homology um, that you get if you invert that those maps. So for example, if you think of the braid groups as sitting side by side with the kth one and the k plus first one, and one included into the other by adding a trivial braid, a, a trivial strand on one side, then that gives you an endomorphism of the monoid. And if you invert that, you can then subtract braids away on the other side and um, you get the, what's called the stable, the cohomology of the stable braid group. And uh, I think it's fair to say it's really hard to calculate the cohomology of the braid group 
as a group, with a stable cohomology of the braid group as a group. Um, on the other hand, this uh, configuration space method uh, uh, really make, brings these things under control. And there's a sort of whole literature about loop spaces of spheres that, that are sort of kind of the basic bricks of an awful lot of modern topology. What was the slide you skipped? The thing about these derived gadgets um, is that they're not allowed to kink. A kink is when you take a, like if you take a loop of wire and pull it tight, in principle, you're gonna get a, a discontinuous point where the map pinches to zero. That may just be an artifact of your presentation uh, as a two-dimensional object. So it's kind of hard to describe this generally. But these, the thing about, if you think of these uh, derived braids as particle trajectories, then they're very non-classical in that the particles have this non-trivial intrinsic topological linking with each other. They're not necessarily linked, but they can't get themselves braided with other particles. Or somehow, if they get braided, they have something else has to get unbraided. So this is a completely topological kind of interaction. And it's uh, kind of very difficult to imagine from uh, a classical uh, viewpoint. And uh, if you think of particles in the plane as having this kind of interaction, then they tend to clump. And you be find yourself beginning to think of themselves, think of them as kind of naturally forming whirlpools and things like that. So I better stop talking. About it, oh, this was the BSF3. Yeah, I was wondering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, that's, yes, exactly. These are model, these hypothetic partic particles with this kind of statistics are ap apparently non-classical models for anions, which uh, are things with funny statistics that are neither fermion nor boson, if you, uh, and there's these things called the spin and statistics theorem, which I think are uh, not well understood and uh, that, this, that are probably relevant when you start talking about configuration spaces. Um, I sort of want to come back to this later. The thing is that there are these groups that uh, look like each other as spaces, but may not be the same as groups. I'm going to move on to talking about these things as topological field theories, if, if, I, if I haven't already. Here comes that uh, little squished uh, sphere construction here that I was talking about before. I want to talk about a kind of topological field theory in which the input states are configuration, finite subsets of the plane, and under time they flow to another uh, configuration space of points in the, in the plane. And I'm gonna, I want to think about this in terms of the model of the braid group in terms of diffeomorphism groups. So that's a, a kind of a categorization of the braid group. And uh, I don't think it's in the literature and it's not hard to uh, write down. So you do this construction that I talked about previously, where you put some points on the sphere and they're in a compact region distinct from infinity, and then you clump them all together. Here's the thing I was looking for about the fundamental group of that collapsed space being free. So you make this sort of pinched space where you can't tell, it's sort of conformal. You can't distinguish infinity from any of the other points. It's defined up to sort of conformal equivalence or something. So that has the, this big free group as its fundamental group. You can abelianize that, that's the homology. And uh, you can add these things up to get a kind of trace map to the integers, which defines an uh, infinite cyclic cover of this configuration space. This is a, the basic trick in knot theory. The fundamental group of a knot abelianizes to the, to the integers. And um, that defines this Alexander cover, which is a space with um, H1, a free module over the group ring, free of finite rank over the group ring. And basically the determinant of the um, translation map on, under that VEC transformation, it, well, something close to the determinant, is the Alexander polynomial or invariant of the knot. <clears throat> if you take a sphere uh, with a point at infinity and one puncture, then you collapse them and you get something that looks like a balloon animal with one squished cycle. And then you unwrap that under the deck transformation group and you get this thing that looks like a, 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 a bubble 
track in a cloud chamber or a, a bubble chamber or whatever. You see some particles zipping along, producing bubbles changing at end to end. And so the higher generation, the higher genus versions of these things are sort of similar. So um, uh, it's, that would be maybe a little tedious to write down uh, uh, in, in um, coordinates, but basically the Borel representation is that representation of the deck transformation group. And the, this, there's a construction, which if you look at that, if you write down coordinates for that kind of construction, um, <clears throat> you can represent it very simply on a single crossing or on a Dane path twist <clears throat> as a matrix that looks like this, which is a kind of, which I guess to pick people who know about Hecke algebra is really very familiar. It's a sort of deformation of the permutation of the, sorry, transposition of action on finite sets. And it has a deformation parameter. One thing, the, I guess the reason I wrote this down is to point out that this transformation uh, has an invariant line and just like the uh, symmetric group, it's action on the Euclidean space strand uh, spanned by the, the integral points or whatever you call integral vectors, <clears throat> has an invariant line. And for a lot of calculations, that <clears throat> winds up making uh, there be a superfluous eigenvalue of zero or something like that. So you want to get rid of that and work with something called the reduced Borel representation. If you take two braids and put them side by side and look at their Borel representatives, you get matrices. And it turns out that putting the braids side by side is exactly the same as putting in the matrices in block diagonal position. So all that says is that the product of braids maps under the Borel representation to the product of uh, invertible matrices over lambda. You don't see this in the, the literature so much because people have removed that superfluous line. Uh, and it's, uh, so uh, it, it's not perhaps written out as clearly as it might. Well, other people are interested in other things. And when you group complete this, the group completion of the system of general linear groups, which is to say the category of you know, projective modules over lambda, which are all free and stuff like that, gives you Quillen's algebra at K theory. So you get what looks to be a really interesting map from this uh, group completion of the braid group to the algebra at K theory of this ring lambda. Jack, could you say, what was the ring lambda again? Yeah, it's the, so you have this cyclic cover of this oh, of, I the, of the space. And so it's uh, on that cyclic cover. I didn't, I guess I didn't write this down anyway, so I'm sorry. Sure. Lambda is uh, the Laurent polynomials over the integers. It's Z, T, T inverse. And uh, the traditional thing is to map that to the complex numbers by sending T to a unit in the complex numbers. Or in other cases, if you want to do p-adic things for some bizarre reason, you send it to some p-adic unit. Um, so it, that, you know, lambda is sort of a uh, big homological dimension or not maybe, uh, but it's um, kind of intimidating, but it, it's algebraic K-theory is pretty much under control. So you get this monoidal functor. It's monoidal, but it's not braided monoidal. See, this is probably the key slide in this whole part of the talk. This is the uh, Joyal Street braid which is basically you take a trivial k-strand patch and lay it over a k-prime k strand patch or the other way around. So, um, so that actually in, in induces a k times k-prime much writhe. And if you try to write down the Borel matrix for such a twist, it's just preposterous. This map uh, respects addition but it's but not it's a it gives you a map of spaces of loop spaces but it doesn't braid well uh, so but the determinant does that's the more if you just sort of look at this and say well the determinant is going to abelianize things all these silly brackets are going to collapse you're just going to add up a bunch of things uh, and you just have to have to count how many there there are well they are k times k prime of them 
And that's the determinant of the braid and that of the Borough representation of the braid, of that twist. And that's essentially the factor, that's the determinant of the Borough representation. And it says that the determinant of the, of the Borough representation defines a sort of fundamental, interesting, one-dimensional character, a kind of invertible topological field theory for this category of braid of points moving around in the circle, in the plane. This is a classical invariant, well, it's very classical, it goes back to Galois. If you take a polynomial with a bunch of roots and you want to ensure that the polynomial has no coincident roots, what you can do is take the difference of these polynomials and multiply them all together. And if the points never coincide, then that product never vanishes. And so you get a map from the space of configurations, unordered configurations, to the complex numbers. Um, and that's a map from the space of configurations. Did I say, did I remind everybody that the pi one of the configuration space of braids is the braid group? Um, I think that was something I meant to say on page one. But mm -hmm. So anyway, you get a map from this space, which whose fundamental group is the braid group to this guy, whose fundamental group is just the integers, because this is just a circle of uh, And similarly on cohomology, you see that map, the Durham, these um, thing about these configuration spaces is that they are rational homology circles. All of their cohomology is torsion except the stuff in degree one. Fibers of this map are beautiful and fascinating. They are kind of Milner vibrations for the braid group. And their a lot is known about their cohomology and their geometry and things like that, but not by me. Uh, and perhaps not one prime at a time, like the way a homotopy theorist might think about it. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I just know that that stuff, this, is the, this kind of thing is the topic of Milner's book on uh, singular points of complex hypersurfaces. Um, but uh, it's sort of very special for this. I mean, the applications I'm going to be talking about are very special. So anyway, if you take this, um, if you take this discriminant map, so I started to say that the discriminant goes back to, to the Egyptians and to you know, grammar school or, high, or juniors high. Whenever you learn to solve the quadratic equation, this b squared minus 4ac, sort of the dis distance between the two roots of the, part of the quadratic equation. And uh, that's exactly the discriminant for two points. Uh, if you apply this to the cohomology, to the Durand cohomology, there's only one cohomology class on the circle. And it pulls back to if you so that but that's a logarithmic cohomology class. And so if you pull it back to the configuration space, you get this thing which looks like a sum of logarithms, because logarithms take products into sums. Um, and it's well known in knot theory as the uh Kinesianik Zabolodchikov uh connection form, uh, which is in this case associated to the Lie algebra of the multiplicative group. The thing is that the, come on, there are lots of fascinating flat vector bundles on the configuration space. Um, and uh, uh, they're well studied because people connect them to um, the Lie algebras, for example, of SLN and do the theory of quantum groups. But the core uh, multiplicative group GL1 don't get its appropriate respect as far as I'm concerned. Um, um, it's people don't pay much attention to it. And I want to sort of contend that it actually deserves some attention. If you look at this thing, if theta, did I call this thing theta? I wanted to call this thing theta. Yeah, here it is. Well, if you call this thing theta, capital theta, there it is. Uh, and write it as a sum of uh, a real and complex part. The real part is just the potential energy of uh, uh, functions in the plane. That's, there's a similar story in all higher dimensions, but in dimension two, you have this extra uh, piece, which shows up in this presentation as imaginary, um, which is the sort of the phase factor associated to the distribution of these points um, in the complex numbers. I presume there's something similar in the quaternions, but uh, 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 I think quaternionic phase probably has to wait for another generation. 
Uh, but this imaginary part in, in dimension two, you have this sort of anomalous thing, which sort of is like the, you know, uh, some kind of sibling of uh, classical geometry, but is um, unfamiliar. Um, and it, you can think of it, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of intrinsically periodic. If you wanted to think of it as a Morse function, it would be a kind of periodic Morse function. And there is sort of technology due to people like Novikov and all for um, dealing with things like that. But in this case, there's something you can do that's more straightforward. Uh, the point is that the hop vibration says that two loops on the two sphere is a string of copies of two loops on the three sphere. If you look at the map from S3 to S2 given by the hop vibration and take two loops of it, you just get one component. So there's this thing called the Nambu Goto area of a surface of a two dimensional surface in three dimensional in three dimensions, which is basically just the area of what it takes to fill in the surface if you embed it in the sphere. And this turns out to be well-defined mod Z if you normalize things correctly. And it gives you a map from loops two S3 down to the, uh, to the circle, a sort of periodic function, which is homotopy equivalent to, this shouldn't be a W here, it should be a delta for Y, that's a typo right there. So this is a sort of homotopy equivalent, uh, homotopy related version of the Newtonian potential, but it's in three space, Newtonian potential in two space, but this is now in three space. And it forms the basis of the earliest model for string theory in which string theory was presented as the minimal surface equation in Minkowski space with two space dimensions and one dimension of time. You, you might think that this is very special, but it turns out uh, that the volume form, this volume form for S3 that makes this work is a feature of all connected, simply connected, blah, blah, Lie groups. They all have a, three, a very important three-dimensional um, homotopy or homology class that goes back to um, Bott and uh, Cartan. And uh, you can use that, you see, in, 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 if you make a string theory model in which this measures somehow the interaction between strings, it's a kind of cubic interaction, it turns out, because you're integrating over this three form. And there's a similar kind of interaction for any um, uh, 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 simply connected Lie group. Um, and this defines a large class of things called uh, West Zumino Witten models uh, that are, have all kinds of uh, ramifications in string theory. So maybe I'll stop there. How about questions? Hi, Jack. Yeah, I had a question. So you had this part earlier. Well, there, I have two questions. So the first one sure. is kind of a simple one with the, the rice, if I'm saying that right, um, oh. as um, being the over crossings minus the under crossings. And then you said something about how you could make that well-defined and I missed it. It was about choice. That's based on a choice of projection into the plane. How, can you say that again? <laughs> uh, I would refer you to a paper called by, by someone named Brundan, B-R-U-N-D-A-N. And behind braids, there are tangles. And it turns out that you can categorize braids as invertible tangles. It's a tangle. So if you, a, a tangle can have a closed loop, but that closed loop can have an inverse. So there's, uh, <clears throat> and what you can do is define the writhe for tangles if you regard tangles, uh, if you regard, regard, if you are thinking about framed uh, oriented framed ribbons. Yes. Okay, so you, you th these, these paths have little normal disks and the little normal disks carry orientations as the particles move around. So that's a natural category that where you can glue things together and so on. It's behind a lot of quantum groups. Uh, and uh, the calculus for the sort of generalization of Reidemeister moves that you need to do this in general is written down very nicely in one of uh, Brundan's papers. He has a lot. Another way to see that the exponent sum is 
well defined is if you look at all the relations in the braid group presentation, the exponent sum on both sides of all those equations are the same. Okay. Awesome. And then the a key observation was that if you once you take the group completion, mm -hmm. the sort of natural map from the braid group down to its um, underlying permutation is that a map of spectra. It's a map yes. of monoids. It's a map of and, monoids. And then you make those into spaces. You group. I mean, you geometrically realize them, and so you get a map of topological monoids, okay. and then so you. Take the classifying space of that monoid, that topological monoid, <laughs> and then you de-loop de it. This is something I should have said. If you take a group, take its classifying space, take a discrete group, take its classifying space, and take the loops on that, you get something which is homotopy equivalent to the original group. If you do that with a proper monoid, you get out of it a loop space, which whose homotopy uh, groups are groups. I mean, who, whose pi zero is a, is, a, is a group, but the map from the monoid to that group is no longer necessarily the identity. And this is a sort of universal uh, thing in the homotopy category uh, that makes a topological monoid into a group. If you take the pre abelian monoid generated by a space, the base points, base pointed space with the base point as zero. That's a monoid. If you group complete that, you get a product of eilenberg maclean spaces whose homotopy groups are the homology of the original space. That's the dol tom theorem. So that's uh, group completion in a very abelian context. Uh, but it has all sorts of non-commutative generalizations. Excellent, thank you. Sure. I was confused by uh, what exactly is loop two of S3 in this context? Uh, after all, there are no non trivial maps from S2 to S3. No, it's a group. Loops two to S3 is actually a group. It's a kind of a Katz Moody group. If you, well, no, it's not a Katz Moody group. Loops, uh, ordinary loops, the based loops, well, I'm sorry. Katz Moody groups are the free loop spaces of compact groups. Those are maps from a circle. But if you look at just maps, pointed maps from the circle to the group that take the base point of the circle to the identity element of the group, that's a group. And you can do this with n spheres. You map the point at infinity on the n sphere to the unit element in the group. You get loops in of G, and that's uh, a group as well under pointwise multiplication of functions. So it it's, is a contractible group. No, it, it has lots of homotopy. It's the, path connected. It's path connected. Oh, oh no, non trivial. It has non, it has a trivial group of components. Okay, fine. It has higher homotopy. Higher homotopy. Okay. So, but as an analytic object, it's very interesting. It's universal cover, I'm going to try to convince you, is this thing that the physicists would call string three. It's the appropriate repository for a, our symmetry group for an orientation that supports some kind of good string theory. <laughs> it's also the the free e2 algebra on s1 yeah yeah just nice nice way to yeah. in this context as what i could say to an audience of people that were had roots in representation theory was that i guess i'm trying to say something about representations of topological monoids and so by representations i mean maps to group like objects there are different kinds of group-like objects in the homotopy theoretic context, and they correspond to whether to sort of what how far they are uh, from being commutative. The notion of commutativity gets sort of filtered in this context, it's sort of like dimension. Uh, and so things like the braid monoid, as uh, John was saying, are sort of E2 level commutative, which is sort of barely commutative. Um, you, things are, homo, are commutative after you take homotopy groups, but before that, there's all kinds of possible room for monkey business. Uh, and as uh, you go up the scale to EN, then you get things that are more and more commutative uh, and behave better and better in some graded sense. The examples that I'm going to be talking about are actually sort of primitive because they're sort of they're going to be related to one-dimensional topological field theories. 
which you might think are not very interesting, but they're sort of like, uh, I think for people uh, coming from groups, they're sort of like characters of, uh, you know, abelian, uh, characters of, of, of abelian groups. And um, if we're talking about these things, there's this um, uh, notion of a Picard category that comes up. I'm not gonna try to read this, it's sort of stupid. It says that, that um, if you have a commutative ring, you can make this category whose, it's an object, a category of graded objects. So you call these things lines and they're in degree n, uh, where n is an integer, positive or negative. And if you take some uh, line that lives in degree n and one that lives in degree m and take their product, you get the one that lives in degree n plus m. Uh, so this is kind of silly. But the morphisms from one line to the other is empty, like braids, if a, their degree is, the, is distinct. But if it's not, then it's just the multiplicative group of the ring that you're operating over. So for example, if you're doing things over the integers, if A is the integers, then the multiplicative group of the integers is plus or minus one in degree one. And so um, these uh, Picard, these, these lines over the integers uh, have two possible braidings, uh, one the commutative one and one the anti-commutative one. But in other, other kinds of rings with more units, there are more complicated braidings which are given by exactly the thing that came up uh, when we looked at the Borel representation. If you should have a functor between two braided categories and it respects the braiding, then you get a braided monoidal functor on their group completions. And it can take values in some category of strangely braided objects, which might be more interesting than the group of two elements. When I was cooking up the Borel representation, I made this one dimensional homology group then I looked at the determinant of an induced map on it. I mean, it's not a one-dimensional homology group. It's the homology group in dimension one can have a big, big uh, rank. But if you take its top exterior power, you get a line and the determinant uh, is what happens on that nth power line. It's the top exterior power. One way to think about that n form is as a volume form on the sphere. That actually came up in the case of the three sphere. What turns out to be relevant to this is that people in number theory like Clausen and others, well, there's a very wonderful paper by Baudry, Gorse, Hopkins, Stoyanowska. It's basically about the one-point compactification of lattices in some sense. So you take an integral, a free abelian group like z to the k, and you want to as associate to that in a homotopy theoretic way, a sphere uh, such that the volume form on the sphere corresponds to the determinant of a map between um, integral lattices. Um, so it turns out you can do this. Clausen says, okay, you've got this integral lattice. Well, that integral lattice, I mean, some, you know, z to the k, some free abelian group, the right k. If you look at its Pontryagin dual, that's a k torus, and its homology has a volume form in degree k, and then it's got a whole bunch of exterior stuff down below. So Clausen said, if we can only just take these lower dimensional cells in that torus, they contribute all this cohomology and just yank them out somehow, uh, we'll get a sphere. So this is a sort of standard construction on the manifold. If you have a manifold and the point on it, you can co uh, collapse everything outside of the little disk around that point to a point and you get a sphere. So you want a construction like this. So that's what, that's, uh, I said the Borel representation gave you a sort of one dimensional topological field theory. You can say the Borel representation gives you this big module. You take this module and uh, you make a torus and then tear out the bottom of the torus and make it a sphere and look at the volume form on that sphere. And that's the determinant. That's gonna be a homotopy theoretic 
version of the determinant. And it's going to go from this braid space to the Picard group of lines over the sphere spectrum, or in particular, p-adic versions for some reason. OK, so that's another kind of new topological monoid that hasn't been in the picture up till now. If you take the n-dimensional spheres, if you take the category whose objects are homotopy spheres and smash them together as a composition law, that gives you a homotopy associated monoid. Uh, and you can group complete that topological monoid and you get this thing that you might call the Picard group of the sphere spectrum, which is actually a very mysterious object. I mean, it's sort of related to the stable, stable homotopy, but sort of in a not very linear way. Uh, there's some beautiful work by Charles Rask about this kind of stuff. So that this is actually lifting, this is a proper homotopy theoretic lift of the Borel representation, which lives in the category of modules. And I'm not claiming, claiming to lift the Borel representation per se, but only its determinant. But its determinant, I'm saying, does have a, a good lift to this Picard category of uh, sphere spectra. And those, these are things that are sort of interestingly like characters in, as far as I can tell, this theory of non-commutative growth and deep groups. Jack, is it possible to say why you were p-completing? What, why you got the p-adic ring spectrum? Like, what's the role that p plays? I wrote a little note about p-adic numbers, but I think I try, won't try to go uh, into that. The point is that, well, basically, this ring lambda is big, and you can do everything that needs to be done in this context by taking the parameter t and making it a suitable unit. Um, and classically, in classical knot theory, the Alexander polynomial or whatever, you took that to be a, a complex number. Uh, but here, you want to look at sort of stable homotopy groups and things like that. So you want something that works at all primes, or in particular, one prime at a time, because that's the way all sort of homotopy, the stable homotopy theoretic calculations work out, just because the numbers split that way. And there is now a good theory of p-adic spaces. And if you talk about a p-adic sphere, a p-adic sphere is just going to be a, some, a space. Uh, the trick in this language is that you think of the, these p-adic spaces as having homotopy groups which live in um, compact, disconnected sets. You, you get a slightly different smash product on this category. You take the classical smash product and uh, p-adically complete it again. But so you can work in a category of p-adic spaces. And in particular, you can take this ring, uh, this lambda ring, and, and interpret a p-adic unit. The thing is that there's essentially only one natural choice. Uh, that, that the group of p-adic units is topologically cyclic. So for all intents and purposes, there's a sort of unique choice. I mean, it's not unique, but best not choose a particular generator. It just has, it's topologically cyclic and you can just work with this much smaller compact topological ring and make these topological spheres. Um, and I suppose you can do such spheres over a group ring like Lambda, but at the current state of the art, that would just kind of be excessive and you might as well appeal to this p-adic machinery, which is going to show up anyway when you get to taking homotopy groups. So the, the twist, this the commutativity constraint, this a to the k times k prime, uh, a is, there's essentially, you just take a topologically cyclic generator uh, for the, in the, for the p-adic units, and that gives you an essentially unique anionic category of lines. There's not really a lot of choice here. I mean, there is an ambiguity up to roots of unity, um, but that you can look at as a grading in another context. So it doesn't interfere with that. In this kind of topology, they turn out to be kind of invaluable. Yeah, so the trick is that the multiplicative group of p-adic numbers at an odd prime is isomorphic by the logarithm mostly to the additive group of p-adic numbers, but, the, but this is not a topological splitting. The logarithm, the p-adic logarithm kills the roots of unity and uh, squashes this bigger group down. I also have a question. So you choose for these for these lines, you choose an orientation, and then once you smash, smash them, there is 
sort of a canonical way to put an orientation on this mesh. Is that where your monoidal structure comes from? Yeah, that's that's something that I forgot to say. There's this monoid of spheres under smash product, but there's a more subtle thing, even in the classical case, that's the monoid of oriented spheres. And so this is like the difference between uh, GL and, and SLN. And when you get into the p-adic context, because there are lots of interesting p-adic units, this becomes a little more complicated. So you can define an oriented p-adic sphere to be a CW space whose integral homology is free over the p-adic integers. Okay, so that's a p-adic sphere. And it's sort of unique up to homotopy because Whitehead's theorem says that a map between two of these things that is invertible on the top dimension is actually a homotopy equivalence. So the card category of oriented spheres, where you have a choice of an isomorphism of this p-adic module with the standard p-adic module, it's just like choosing an orientation class in the classical case. It's only defined up to a unit. That's part of the package for an oriented sphere. And so when you smash two of these oriented spheres together, you get an orientation on the homology module. And because uh, you have a Kenneth theorem and because multiplication in these p-adic numbers is commutative, that's just what it ought to be to give a braiding on the category of p-adic um, homotopy spheres. So there's a Picard category of homotopy spheres, and there's a category of spheres over the p-adic line and the map between them is given by taking uh, integral homology, which lives in only one dimension because of these properties of these spaces. Uh, and that map is an equivalence in degree zero and one. But in the algebraic case, it stops in degree one. Whereas in the topological case, there's a whole big bunch of stuff left in this Picard category, which might be nothing but which we know by work of Charles Resk in particular, uh, which clause in science, we know this to be a big ch uh, chunk of this thing called the image of J, which is what generates most of the algebraic topology of uh, classical, say, algebraic varieties and so on. So there's a lot more to this morale orientation uh, than you might see uh, in the algebra. I mean, in the algebra, you see it's shadow, but it turns out to see things in higher homotopy that are really uh, uh, interestingly subtle. And they're like character. This is like a character. It's like as if C cross um, was a kind of well-behaved but complicated thing that had interesting stuff in all interesting homotopy groups in all dimensions. And they're all sort of finite and tangled up with Bernoulli numbers and stuff like that. And then here is this the technicalities for this uh, construction of the uh, stable sphere. These guys, these uh, guys who are really working on this stuff want to do this for p-adic Lie, Lie algebras because they're interested in the adjoint representations of p-adic Lie groups. Uh, in the case here, the groups are abelian. And so you can, in principle, uh, simplify this material I guess I just wanted to say that uh, from my point of view, the one way to think about this is that they invoke a funny combination of dualities. You take a free abelian group, you take its Pontryagin group, Pontryagin dual, that's a dual torus, and then you take the Spanier Whitehead dual of that, which means you sort of turn it upside down homologically so that it lives in negative dimensions. So those are two contravariant functors, and you compose them, and you get a covariant functor. And so you get this con construction uh, from something in the category of free abelian groups to the category of spectra. And then you play some games with taking p-adic limits with these things, which sort of wind up wiping out all but the top homology of this space, uh, which makes it into a p-adic sphere. And so you get something like this. So you get this, I've managed to 
who knew Hugh Arlington coming into the peanut category with me. Uh, but the moral of the story is that these all fit together to give you an integral construction of the Eilenberg McLean spectrum as a Tom spectrum. So you take these uh, things that come from grade groups and you do Tom constructions using, instead of vector bundles, you use spherical vibrations. And so you can make a cobordism theory of those things, which is sort of uh, a version of Pontryagin duality cobordism, which is in some sense technically accessible, but uh, which is kind of horrible because it has all kinds of stuff in negative dimensions that have to do with transversality obstructions that you don't encounter in smooth topology. It's kind of been, even though it's understandable, perhaps it's been kind of less aside. Okay, so now in these notes, I wanted to at least uh, make a gesture toward providing a proof of the hopkins mahoa so, theorem. Sorry, what, how, how do you do a Tom construction on spherical perturbations? Um, what do you collapse to? You basically, basically don't. Instead of taking, so if you've got a manifold, it has a tangent space. Uh, and you make this Tom construction where you do this one, one point compactification of the yeah. tangent, the sort of generalized cone. On the other hand, if you've got something like a homology manifold, you can take a point on the manifold and look at the, and collapse the complement of a infinitesimal open neighborhood to a point. That gives you a sphere sort of a canonically associated to that point. And so you can think of that as defining a bundle. You've got an N manifold. You can think of that as defining a bundle of N spheres over the manifold. That's not quite the same as the usual Riemannian construction, which gives you a bundle of N minus one spheres over the N manifold, but it's close enough for government work. And uh, so you have this bundle of N spheres over the N manifold, and its classifying space is the monoid, its classifying group or monoid in this case, is the monoid of degree one maps from the n-sphere to the n-sphere. So it's like Tom theory, except instead of getting GLN of the reals, you get loops in on SN. Although that space, the, the product structure on loops in SN that comes up is the is composition of maps, which is sort of not really very distributive with respect to the loop sum of uh, on those loop spaces, which makes things that's a second that's that's why this SF three the degree one self maps of the three sphere. That's some this gives me an excuse to say that it's it seems absolutely bizarre that this uh, group of self maps of the three sphere should come up in this context. This is something like the Galois group of the integers over the sphere spectrum. Um, this is work of Rockness and Roth and Beardsley and other people. Uh, and it just seems completely crazy unless you start thinking that, well, maybe the spectrum of the ring of integers is some kind of homological three sphere as uh, Barry Mazur and some not theorists would have it. So from that point of view, it makes no sense, but that's just poetry, as far as I can tell. So in these notes, I sort of sketched out the proof of this theorem of Mahol and Hopkins, uh, and I propose now to skip it. Relevant part is that, I mean, the, the spaces that are involved here are actually quite well understood. They're classical, they know their behavior over the Steenrod algebra and all these other algebras of operations. Um, are um, well understood. And the issue is sort of what the map between them does. And because this is a double loop map, it respects something called, uh, there are these operations on loop spaces called dyer lashoff operations. And uh, this is a double loop space uh, matter. So there's only one relevant dyer lashoff operation going on in these degrees. And because this is a gradient monoidal map, we know that this map commutes with that operation. And so basically, you, it, uh, it's quite easy to check um, that. I mean, that's uh, what Hopkins and the whole realized was all that needed to be done, was to check this in low dimensions and sort of see 
that the homology map pulls back, the, the map induced in homology between these relevant spaces pulls back a free submodule on one element, a, a submodule that's free over the spin rod algebra on one generator. And that's enough to give this, to find this um, integral Islander plane spectrum. There's nothing new in this argument, except that in this case, we have a, uh, a natural choice for this map. In the hopkins mahola construction, you, sh you choose an appropriate map and it's easy to see uh, why there's a, a, a particularly nice one, um, but it's not exactly natural. And this Borau thing is sort of natural. So this is just a sort of rigidification of that argument. So there's, there is one further thing I thought I should say about this E2 multiplication, which is to say something that an E2 multiplication technically means an operation of the E2 operad. The E2 operad is basically the grade operad. And the operad part of that, that isn't sort of familiar is comes from the operation of cabling. And I tried to draw a picture here of what cabling amounts to. Cabling amounts to taking a braid and for each strand in the original braid, duplicating it a number of times and putting in a flat copy of that line uh, of that multiplication in the original braid. So it's an operation that takes a braid, makes the braid group on K strands operate on the collection of K braid groups to give you a braid on the number of st strands, which is the sum of all these guys. So it's, you know, it allows you to braid braids. And once you have an action with that operate, operad, that makes all this stuff work. So that's my explanation of operads for your grandmother who knows how to knit. Um, so anyway, if you want to do this geometrically, I mean, so you can ask what kind of geometric applications this might have. And uh, I have to apologize for not having one at hand. The thing is that a lot of this stuff about homology manifolds that I've been telling you goes wrong or is complicated in dimension four. And I put some references below to papers of Frank Quinn back in the 70s that tend to deal with that kind of thing. So, you know, hum, the relations between homology manifolds and Poincaré cobordism are sort of tricky in dimension four. And so I would, uh, that, and the thing is that if you look at these, if you look for interesting examples, they all sort of show up around dimension. I mean, there's a whole bunch of interesting examples of maps between spheres that come up in this context in dimensions where one or the other of the relative dimensions is something like four or five or three or something like that. Uh, so that's kind of a specialist topic. And so I mentioned at the beginning that this project goes back to work when Dale and I were at, uh, in Princeton in the 70s. Um, and Dennis Sullivan was talking about geometric topology. And one of the things that you could see sort of concerned him seriously was what a geometric cycle should, should mean. He was working in the on, in terms of surgery, um, and so you can you know the, you can you can so, so in in this Hopkins Mahola thing says assuming that all of these uh, four ignoring these possible four dimensional things, a geometric cycle is defined by something like a proper map maybe between between two homology manifolds. If you have such a map, you can define its normal bundle in terms of spherical vibrations. Um, and the criterion for it to be representable by an integral homology cycle is that that normal structure should lift through this loops two S3 made uh, three connected, which is again, kind of sounds kind of bizarre because this loops two S3 made three connected space is this thing that is, you know, all the rage in string theory, which is no longer fashionable. But anyway, it has to do with string structures. And so if you, if the string normal, uh, if the normal spherical bundle can be reduced to this SF3-3 thing, then it can be re represented by an integral homology cycle. That's a sort of homotopy theoretic statement. But the structure group 
for this reduced bundle is this configuration space for this thing that the physicists call a West Zuminio Witten model for strings in three space with this sort of cubic interaction that comes from the Nambuboto uh, form. And so this is like saying, well, there's some kind of physical model that witnesses the geometrization of this cycle, that uh, this Galois group for the eilenberg maclean spectrum over the sphere spectrum is sort of like Borger's descent data in F1 theory. This is something like descent data from an integral arithmetic structure to a topological structure is the descent data is WZW model. So this is like the physicists who want geometry to emerge from the analysis. So actually, you know, if you want to send them down possibly a blind alley so they can waste the rest of their academic lives studying things like that, you can tell them about this. Maybe that's a good place to stop. Thank you. That's a beautiful talk. Are there any questions? This says that the space of configuration of points on the plane has a kind of universal cover. And I think it looks like the space of configurations of finite points on the Riemann surface of log Z, of log N. Uh, that the logarithm, you know, the log logarithm defines an infinite uh, uh, cyclic cover. So here's the Hawaiian earring, you know, this thing that you get by wedging a bunch of circles together. If you take the Hawaiian earring and spin it around, you get something that's like an onion. Uh, it's a bunch of spheres. It's a sort of collapsed, it's a sort of uh, matryoshka version of that bubble tree that I had, or that bubble uh, chain that I had. You just sort of pull these out one after the other. It's like, and so that defines a kind of central extension, I claim, of this central of the monoid of finite points on the plane. And uh, that's where, in some sense, these derived, demented, writhless particles live, if you want to think of things in that way, or if you want to write a story about that. Uh, so here it is sort of as a central extension, um, not from the braids, the derived braids uh, included in here with the integers as a quotient. And here it's on this pullback, it's a cover. So I, I loved your poem, but I only was able to hear half of it. So could you repeat your poem about spec Z and the three sphere? So there's this kind of Mesa idea that spec Z is something like a three sphere and primes that- I think it goes back to Barry Mazer and other people. There's this group of self, of homotopy self equivalences of the three sphere. You might think of it as something like GL3 or something. And the question is, why does this come up in the midst of this sort of abstract discussion about realizing homotopy theoretic things as geometric things? You might think of it as something like having something to do with algebraization, with writing them down in terms of you know, a finite number of algebraic equations or something like that. Um, you might expect to see something involving the integers, but instead you see something involving the three sphere. And that just sort of seems to come out of nowhere, unless you're willing to think perhaps of uh, the three of the spectrum of the integers as a three sphere. Uh, the cohomology of uh, algebraic number fields are sort of three dimensional. I mean, sometimes they're infinite dimensional, but they're sort of virtually all three dimensional, if, if I understand it correctly. And the hypothesis is that in some that there's some universal compactification of spec Z, which behaves nicely algebraically and is something like an arithmetic three sphere. This is a, a fairy story as far as I'm concerned, but it, I mean, but it seems a natural way to try to explain what the things that come up in this uh, construction look like. Thanks. Hi, yeah, I think this is sort of building on that previous question, but it sounds like you alluded to a construction of like HZ or a moral construction of HZ based on these ideas. I was wondering if you could go over that. 
Oh, uh, well, yes, that is the Hopkins Mahola construction, if I understand this right. Uh, they construct a map from loops two S3, or rather from its simply connected cover to the classifying space for a stable spherical vibrations. And they take that just like to con construct ordinary cobordism. Um, you take the Tom spaces of the unitary group or GLN or whatever, and pull them back systematically as Tom spaces and make a spectrum whose homotopy groups give you cobordism. This is the inverse is provided by the Pontryag and Tom construction. So you can do a similar construction where instead of pulling back vector bundles, you pull back these spherical vibrations. And so that gives you a representation of the allenberg mclean spectrum as a cohomology theory. So it's, you get a collection of finite complexes uh, which fit together under iterated suspension to construct the integral allenberg mclean spectrum in a sort of geometrically, in a geometric way, rather than just sort of in terms of constructions of the monoid, uh, you know, abelian monoids. And so this, that the controlling space in that construction is this, is a classifying space for some kind of group. And uh, it looks like uh, formally it has the properties of a Galois group in the sense of Lochness. So it's a sort of dual to a Galois group. It's sort of, it's uh, suspension spectrum is something like the algebra of functions, the commutative algebra of functions on the structure group or some kind of bundle. So this uh, SF3 thing or something very close to it is like a Galois group for the integers over the, over the sphere spectrum and is sort of part of the Galois theory for a ring spectrum. After the notes, there's some commentary on the first part of this talk and there's some references in there uh, to that kind of construction in cobordism theory where you're looking at like oriented cobordism as uh, a Galois extension of complex cobordism or something like that. You can take a complex structure and forget it and regard it, forget that structure and regard that as an oriented manifold. And that's the kind of, there's a kind of Galois theory for that. In my uh, manic state, I thought about what could the soundtrack be for this presentation. And I decided that if I was going to have a soundtrack, I would play Southern Cross by Crosby, Stills, and Nash. But then I thought you would probably consider that corny. Thank you for inviting me. Let's uh, thank Jack again.